as uh, far as 50 kilometers, because tsunami can go upstream uh, by the river. And the casualty was uh, 25,000, and the evacuee was uh, 342,000. And uh, th not only the earthquake and the tsunami, uh, the disaster was compounded by uh, Fukushima, as you know. And as you can see, the wave reached uh, the height of 46 meters. And uh, the most important thing about uh, the reactors is that you have to uh, shut it down once a disaster happens. We succeed in that one, but we have to cool it. But we lost electricity because all the grid lines uh, went down, and then uh, the, all the emergency uh, generators also went down with the tsunami. So uh, three disasters, but uh, a lot of people don't understand, but there were also effects of the earthquake where we had fires uh, in the proximity of Tokyo in Chiba. And, uh, but on the other hand, uh, we have learned the experience uh, after a lot of earthquakes, and uh, we were quite resilient to uh, the earthquake. When the, uh, uh, the uh, earthquake struck, nine, uh, magnitude 9, there were 26 uh, Shinkansen trains, which travels about 250k per hour, running on those lines. But uh, no, no derailment. How do we do that? We sensed the first wave of the earthquake. We uh, informed the uh, tracks, and then it will automatically slow down so that uh, they will not derail. And this is uh, the one uh, of uh, the uh, seismic highway bridges on the left-hand side. They are intact. But non-seismic structure, uh, it's, it's, you cannot see it very clearly, but uh, it has been damaged. But uh, the new uh, norm was introduced after the Hyogo framework, where we learned from the uh, COVID disaster. 2,000 of them, they survived. Now, also, uh, some of our uh, experience was reflected in uh, the uh, late area. On the right-hand side, there are the schools that we have built. And on the left, you see the scenery. And uh, they are intact. And uh, a closer look is that uh, we had uh, 43 buildings, and around that area, all the roofs had gone, but uh, our roof uh, stayed. And uh, you curl the, uh, uh, what was that, uh, reinforced uh, iron around, and then uh, you can control the wind better. And uh, also, it's very important to educate the uh, community, as I think uh, Margaret was saying a lot about the involvement of the local community. So uh, we had to educate the kids and uh, to uh, take calm and quick evacuation. And also, the recovery effort and so on, the community comes out and the uh, voluntary uh, construction company brings out the heavy equipment and uh, get rid of the debris. And uh, everyone uh, helped it, pitched in. And in that way, uh, the ra road was repaired quite quickly. Uh, in five days' time, uh, the road on the right was on March the 12th. And in five days' time, uh, we recovered that one. And the Sendai Airport, it took about a month. Uh, it was flooded by the tsunami. And, uh, but uh, we somehow managed to do that. And uh, also, uh, we also have waterworks who are resistant to the uh, uh, Earthquake. I think uh, Mr. Nazaro was saying about uh, the uh, telecommunication things to be buried uh, underground, which will uh, help uh, to cope against the wind. But it should also be uh, able to cope with the earthquake and that sort of things. And so, investment for disaster mitigation pays. I think uh, the uh, commissioner was uh, uh, emphasizing a lot about one dollar, and then you get the seven dollar return. And then uh, it's also important that we combine hardware and software. Software means training people in the local community. And also we have a plan where once a disaster strikes, a certain construction company have a responsible area where they uh, start uh, the reconstruction work right away. And then the government uh, repay them afterwards. So that kind of uh, uh, things has to be done. Now, uh, lastly, I just want to mention that uh, the uh, climate change issue is a huge issue, and uh, we are fully aware of that. But our strategy was to cope with climate change through nuclear reactors. But as you have seen in Fukushima, we lost 30% of our electricity capacity because none of uh, the 52 uh, 
nuclear power plants is working. But uh, our uh, coal-fired power generation uh, technology is highly efficient. Uh, we are about 10% better than the best, uh, I think, UK and Ireland and Germany. And uh, compared to India, I think we are about 20% uh, uh, no, 30% better. And also we have, uh, uh, this is, uh, it looks like an incinerator, and actually it's an incinerator, but uh, with uh, the garbage we put in the, to the top of the, the uh, furnace, and then we uh, burn them by 1,800 degree. And then we can control the emission of dioxin and other toxic gas. And uh, the end result will be slag and metal, which we can use for construction and uh, roads. So, uh, I like this picture. Uh, we try, we prepare, and then uh, rest in peace. But it will happen. So once you wake up, you have to work very hard. Thank you very much for your attention. Yes, honorable Senator, uh, honorable secretaries, uh, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, I try to, to be brief and quick to meet uh, the standard set by uh, my previous speaker. Let me go right into uh, what I'm going to say. I was invited to introduce a discussion on the role of international humanitarian uh, assistance organizations in disaster risk reduction and response, a topic that will be further discussed in Working Group 3. I'm fully aware, of course, that this is quite a challenging task. Uh, evidently, I cannot speak on behalf of the international uh, humanitarian organizations as a whole, and I will certainly not attempt to provide a blueprint uh, to bring the system to perfection, but I would like to share with you some thoughts on the way forward and to do so from a perspective of one of the actors that has been involved in the response to Haiyan that has lived the international coordination around in and which is regularly involved in the response to mega disasters and supports integrated approaches to disaster risk reduction, not only disaster management. Typhoon Haiyan has shown us the horrible face of mega disasters. Unfortunately, as we heard this morning, it will not be the last time that this will happen. Progressively uh, changing climate, environmental degradation, the ever-growing population, all are factors to consider. One uh, interesting or relevant information, by the end of this decade, the first time in human history, more than half of the global population will be living in cities with all their complexities and vulner vulnerabilities, and it would show what really the challenges are. In such a context, international solidarity around disasters will continue to be of utmost importance. No country can pretend to be immune from mega disasters, to be able to handle them alone and to do it on their own. Showing strong solidarity in the face of disaster is not only a moral obligation, it is also an opportunity to develop the relationships between our nations. Sharing a burden together creates dialogue and new bonds. It builds confidence and has the potential to contribute to diffusing tensions where they exist. In short, jointly preparing for and responding to disasters enhances the global security of our nations, of our continents, not just Asia and Europe. But as we all know much too well, resources are always scarce. Therefore, we have to think of improving our way of dealing with disasters. On the one hand, it is evident that increasingly efforts and resources need to be redirected towards prevention and mitigation, increasing the resilience of our societies. This is also valid for international actors, actors and I will revert to this a little later. On the other hand, we will still need international mobilization for search and rescue operations, for relief as well as rehabilitation and reconstruction, of course. So what can be improved in the, international to dis in the international response to disasters? Uh, let me put a, a couple of points forward. First, international coordination at the global level. Over the past decades, the UN system has developed a framework for coordination of international humanitarian interventions, which has produced very positive results. Uh, UN OCHA, uh, has taken a key role in ensuring a coherent response to emergencies. Teams of the UN uh, Disaster Assessment Coordination are able to deploy within 12 to 48 hours anywhere in the world. Standards have been defined for search and rescue, and here 
I'm, uh, I'm referring to the International Search and Rescue Advisory Group. The International Standing Committee has also recently engaged in a transformative ag agenda to improve the coordination of all the actors in the response. During the response to Haiyan, the humanitarian country team and the cluster system were able to deliver timely uh, products and guidelines. This was not only effective, it was also very appreciated by the uh, international humanitarian community. However, there is still room for improvement. As highlighted by the OCHA peer, peer assessment review, the number of international, uh, internationals deployed may have been slightly too high and to some degree overwhelming national response coordination efforts. It was also recommended that additional measures could be taken to strengthen the humanitarian country team. It seems that there is potential for improving the UN system, not only through better preparedness of each organization and good coordination during responses, but also more generally in better defining the roles and responsibilities of disaster risk reduction and for disaster risk reduction. My, th my second thoughts relates to the international cooperation at the regional level. Regional organizations such as ASEAN with the AHA Center, the European Union, or the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, OSCE, are increasingly well prepared to play important roles in disaster risk reduction and management. Regional organizations convene countries that are geographically close and culturally familiar. Such regional groups have a potential for quicker response and higher aid effectiveness. They can also easily learn from each other. The question begs, are we willing, uh, sorry, are we witnessing an evolution towards an international system where a mega disaster will not necessarily trigger a global international response, but could be handled at the regional level if it is a not so big mega disaster? I look forward to the working group's reflection on this question. On a third point, I would like to address the new partnerships. In the response to Haiyan, coordination among the government, don the government donors, the broad humanitarian community, the military and the private sector was very positive. Not only due to the success of the UN coordination, but also due to the pre-existing relationship among different actors. For, for instance, global logistic companies are training specialized staff in disaster management to support the humanitarian community in times of crisis, and some of them have teamed up with the traditional humanitarian actors in response to Haiyan on the basis of prior agreement. The national private sector, and we've heard it uh, by the previous speaker from PLDT, has also, a has also had a remarkable role in, um, uh, in logistic support during the re relief operations. We also see other types of new partnership. For example, Switzerland is supporting the involvement of remote sensing and crop insurance for agricultural products in Southeast Asia, together with Allianz 3, the GI set, and the International Rice Research Institute, and with SARMOP, a provider of satellite data services. Can we think of other new alliances for prevention, early warning, and emergency response? Do we need incentives for it? Should we think of more persuasive, maybe even coercive measures? Or do we need both carrots and sticks? Questions to be answered and discussed by the third working group. My last point uh, concerns the national coordination in and by affected communities, countries. Actually, this should have been my first point because every country is obviously in charge of coordination, uh, of coordinating the response to its disasters. And because the international response will seek to link up with the national coordination. We are talking about the so-called bridging mechanism. It's not always the case that the national coordination is fully operational when the international aid begins to arrive. In the case of Haiyan, for example, a, deci a decision had to be taken rapidly where and how the Swiss emergency response team would respond, scrutinizing what other actors were planning and detecting the strong focus on Takloban, we headed for northern Cebu and western Leyte. Once the site was found, uh, we realized that local coordination was already very effective in guiding us towards meeting the needs of the people that were suffering in those areas. Ideally, 
And this is how we would like to see disaster response in a mega disaster. If it happened in Switzerland, the response would be managed by the local level with an on-site operation and coordination center coordinating the operations of all humanitarian actors, whereas at the national level, we would have a reception and departure center in place before the first international aid arrives. It is also important to note that support, what support the international humanitar humanitarian actors will need, for example, a liaison offers, interpreters, and other aspects. So in summary, we would think, we could think or should think of four points. Further improve the UN response system. Secondly, defining the role that regional organizations are going to play. Thirdly, promoting new partnerships. And fourth, preparing our countries internally for the response of the international community, not only at the national level, but also and above all at the subnational and the local level. Before I close, uh, and I'll do this quickly, let me come back to disaster risk reduction as opposed to disaster response. In the international humanitarian community, uh, if the international humanitarian community has reasons for intervening in, in disaster response, then it should have an even stronger motivation for supporting disaster risk reduction. We all know, and we have it heard it repeatedly this morning, that prevention is better than cure. We're talking about building back better, about avoiding da dangerous areas, about pre preparedness for the next disaster, early warning, reducing emergency risks, and preventing the buildup of new risks, risk finance, and so on. Ultimately, we would like to tackle the root causes of risk, such as poverty, environmental degradation, and climate change. The task, of course, seems enormous, but what we have to do is to continue stepping in the right direction. This conference will contribute to, will contribute to that ob objective, as other initiatives will do also. I would like to mention particularly the Nansen Initiative, which addresses the problem of displaced persons across international borders by disaster. And we have heard this morning at this, uh, during the speech of President Aquino uh, how he referred to the situation in the South Pacific. And we would also support uh, the disaster response dialogue, which is jointly supported by Switzerland, the Philippines, the International Federation of the Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies, and BIOCHA, and which has the aim of improving the international response system on the basis of a broad dialogue. Last but not least, Mrs. Wallström has mentioned the very important process that is underway for defining the next global framework for disaster reduction. Let us all make sure that this framework will show the right direction and that resilience will ultimately progress more than risk, reversing the trend towards more and more need for international humanitarian aid. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. It is my honor to greet you all in the name of the UN country team, the Philippines UN country team, my own as the UN resident and humanitarian coordinator for the Philippines. 